What's worse than a bad movie? A generic, forgettable movie. Speaking of The Seeker, The Dark is Rising, let's talk about how that movie could have been better. This movie features a kid named Will Stanton, who finds out he has the power to find these six magical artifacts that will somehow help the old ones defeat the evil Dark Rider in a war of good and evil. It's based on the book The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper. My rule for these videos is that the books don't matter. I'm just here to suggest ways the movie could have been better. I haven't read any of these books, and I have no clue how much this movie diverges from what happens in the books, but I have read a little bit about these books. Merriman Lyon, one of Will's mentors in the movie, is, spoilers for the book, supposed to be Merlin. Even though I didn't read any of the books, that's why I watched this movie, because I'm a big King Arthur fan. But the movie doesn't make any references to King Arthur or Merlin or anything interesting. I'm breaking my own rule suggesting the movie should have done something a little closer to the books, because at least the books sound more interesting than what the movie did. I can think of a few different ways connecting some of these bland characters into the mythos of King Arthur and Camelot might have made for a more interesting narrative. Tell us Merriman is Merlin. Let all of the old ones be connected to Camelot. Francis Conroy could be Morgan Le Fay. In most stories, Morgan is an enemy of Arthur, but in her introduction, she was an ally. You could say she used to be an enemy and found redemption and is now allied with Merlin against the forces of evil, like The Last Defender of Camelot by Roger Zelazny. I need to know what's at stake. Merriman says a thousand years ago there was a war between light and darkness, and the dark is preparing to strike again through the Dark Rider. What does the Dark Rider want? What happens specifically if he succeeds? The Dark Rider threatens to kill Will's family, he mind controls his older brother, squeezes his sprained ankle, but we don't know why he's doing what he does. Connect the Dark Rider to King Arthur as well. He's Mordred, Arthur's nephew and the guy responsible for the fall of Camelot. Why did he betray Camelot? Some stories have Arthur order all the noble babies born in May to be put on a ship and set out to sea to die, because one of the babies is Mordred, who Merlin says will bring the kingdom down. This doesn't work, and Mordred ends up doing exactly what Arthur wanted to prevent. Do something like that. Mordred wasn't a baby, but a soldier in Arthur's army, and Merlin could sense darkness in him, and counseled Arthur that the kingdom is in great danger because of him. Arthur pulls a David and Uriah from the Old Testament, orders his men to abandon Sir Mordred on the front lines of battle. Near death, Sir Mordred calls upon the forces of darkness to save him. Then he incites a civil war and brings down Camelot. In the present day, Mordred feels guilty about the fall of Camelot. He was a soldier trying to protect the little man when corrupt leaders tried to kill him. Why does Mordred want the six signs? He wants to recreate the golden age of Camelot, where just knights protect the king's subjects from harm. He'll see himself at the top of this utopian kingdom. This will absolve him of destroying paradise the last time around, at least in his mind. This adds dimension to Merlin as well. Merlin is already a sketchy dude, willing to help the king deceive a woman so he can get in bed with her. So advising preemptively betraying Sir Mordred is in character for him. Now Merlin seeks atonement for this. He cannot let this guy take over the planet because it will throw the natural order of magic out of balance. This is very Last Jedi with the hero's mentor responsible for the creation of the villain, but that's okay. Star Wars borrowed here and there from King Arthur as well. This provides some good story potential. When Will accepts that he is the Seeker, he trusts the Old Ones implicitly, but when he finds out about Merwin's actions in the past and Mordred's at least attempt to right his own wrongs once he gets the signs, it gives him reason to reconsider what he's doing. He ends up siding with the Old Ones, but a little moral complexity never hurt any children's story. Finding out your elders have made mistakes just like you is a good lesson for kids to learn. But through the actions the characters are taking now, Will realizes the old ones are still on the side of right in this conflict. But why is the Dark only taking action now? Merriman says when Will turned 14, his ability to sense the signs alerted the Dark Rider to his presence. But later we find out Will's twin brother was kidnapped when he was a baby, by the Dark Rider. So he apparently knows Will is the Seeker, even before he uses his powers. I get that the Dark Rider can't find the signs. Nobody can, except the Seeker. We also find out one of Will's ancestors was one of the Old Ones, and he is the one who built and hid the signs, even from his fellow Old Ones. But why? If they need the signs to defeat the darkness, why is he hiding them? If the light aren't 100% good, and the Dark Rider isn't 100% evil, then Will's ancestor could have taken issue with the way Merlin and Arthur tried to get rid of Mordred, so he broke ranks from the rest of the Old Ones and hid the signs. Maybe that's how Mordred was so easily able to overthrow Arthur and destroy Camelot. That still leaves unanswered questions, but at least it's something. Spoilers, Will is the final sign. How did that work? How did Will's ancestor manage to turn a kid who wouldn't be born for a thousand years into one of the signs? You could say each of Will's ancestors had the potential to be the final sign until they sired another kid. Since Will is the youngest son, he inherited it. But if he had a younger brother, it would have been him. That isn't airtight, as Will does have a younger sister, but this is a sexist holdover from the Dark Ages. Chicks can't be the final sign. This is a man's world. Again, not perfect, but at least it's an explanation.
explanation. Let's say there's a treaty where Mordred cannot directly act against Merlin or Morgan, and vice versa. My favorite scenes were when the Dark Rider is pretending to be a doctor, or bringing his elderly mom to church, or chatting up with Bear Mormon and his buddy, before he kills one of them. Do more of that. These guys don't like each other, but they're locked in stalemate, waiting for Will to find the signs. Since Merlin and Morgan chose Will to act as their agent, Mordred does the same thing. Enter Maggie, the girl Will likes that the movie telegraphs is a bad guy from a hundred miles away. For the first half of the movie, she's girl next door that Will likes. Then she does a magic trick, he asks if she's an old one, and she acts confused by this. Will doesn't bother following up on any of this with any of the old ones. Hey, did you send her to watch me? When the Dark Rider talks to a mysterious cloaked figure, he says he's recruited more than one person to act against Will, and he works his magic on Will's older brother. Who else could this be? I guess it could be anyone else in the family, or maybe one of the other old ones. When we first meet Bear Mormon and his friend, I thought they were bad guys, so the idea of an old one falling to the dark side is possible, I guess, but I think the three people who watched this movie all knew that it was Maggie. Here's what you do. Early in the movie, something happens when Will is hanging out with his sister. Maggie is there. The older brother she's dating is there. They all get roped into Will's quest. They all suitably freak out. In the movie, when Will's sister is nearly killed by a Viking in the past, she doesn't react to it. If she didn't take a kitten from the past back home with her, you wouldn't know she remembers this. Once Will sufficiently explains to them what's going on, he takes it upon himself to deputize them to help him on his journey. Will should have had a learning curve with his abilities. The old ones tell him all these powers he has, but they never bother training him. Later he says, light, and that's enough for his magic to kick in. No difficulty learning the skill set, no tension in a scene where a skilled magic user could handle a threat with ease, but he's a novice and he's struggling. You know, things a normal movie would do. While our characters are in danger, Maggie gives Will some advice. Worded like a friend who doesn't know what's going on, she just wants him to try every option. But whatever it is, it works. Later, at a crucial moment, Will has most of the signs, and she steals them and shows her true colors. The audience is smart enough to figure out that if the writer cannot act directly, he would choose an agent to act for him. We don't need the scene of him talking to a mysterious cloaked figure. Oh, can we trim like 80% of Will family out of the movie. I get that's a thing in the books, but this is way too many supporting characters for us to care about in an hour and 40 minutes. Sorcerer's Stone was an hour longer than this and had fewer characters for us to get to know. Since fans of the books are already mad at all the liberties you've taken, why not keep going? Anyway, Will finds out he has a twin brother who was kidnapped as a baby by the Dark Rider. The Dark Rider is mysteriously defeated. Merriman says the battle is never over, but this is a good day. Then Francis Conroy brings out Will's twin brother, Tom. Wait, Will and Tom? Oh. Then the movie is like, yay, happy ending, Tom gets to come home, and nobody has any questions about where he's been for 14 years, or how Will found him. The movie didn't need a gruesome ending, but this is way too gushy and sweet with everything tidied up at the end. If it was me saying, screw the book, let's try our best with this movie and make as many changes as we can, I wouldn't even give Will a twin brother. The old ones tell him he's special, after some cops turn into ravens and attack him, he believes them and has adventures. But if you want to keep the twin thing, he should not go back to his his family that doesn't know him. Instead, Will sees Tom and says, let's go home. And Tom says, that isn't my home. I spent 14 years trapped in a crystal ball. My home is here with the weird paranormal stuff. While Will is the seeker, his job is done. He sought, the battle was won, but as Merwin said, the war goes on. And Tom is volunteering to be the warrior who will continue to work with the old ones when the darkness tries something again. I poo-pooed movies that are arrogant enough to think they're getting a sequel, but this could have been your hint of things to come if you do get a sequel. And and in the next movie, this actor can stretch his acting muscles and play Tom differently than he played Will, less socially awkward and more confident, since he's intimately familiar with the world of the weird that he would be dealing with. I don't know if this would have made the movie any more popular with general audiences. I'm certain fans of the books would hate it, but like I said, I'm just looking at ways to turn this into something a little better. I hope you guys liked this one, and if you did, come back next week where I will be talking about something else. Until then, have a good one.